If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button as well as the bell to be notified of future videos. Thank you. Hello Internet, we are back here with Lori uh, Sohot. And I must tell you this fellow, he, he, he astonishes me. I mean, he can tell a story like no one else. He had the most fantastic time when he was as the National Serviceman at Operation Savala. And this is the third episode, and I'm glad to tell you people there's going to be more episodes with this man. He's a walking library. He's really, he's, he's, <laughs> he's fantastic. I, I really enjoy listening to him, and I know that you people also enjoy him that much. Laurie, thank you. Thank you for coming back. I know your uh, daughter got married. We wish to uh, yeah. wish you, you uh, a, a, a happy couple, many children, whatever you say in Hebrew, we say in that. Yes. Right, thank Mazel you. Tov. What, yeah. what do you say? That all right? Yeah, that's great. Mazel tov. That's it. Mazel tov. Thank you, mate. It's over to you. If you can just All give right. us a short background where we ended. Yeah, so so, um, so the first two sessions, actually, we took uh, the first uh, month of Operation Zulu, uh, beginning in uh, the leaving of, of the troops uh, from Tusai, from Rosade, uh, into, bat into the Battle of Rosades, uh, after crossing the Southwest African border. Uh, from there, we moved up, uh, no more to Sai, but now as part of Zulu, we moved up and took over the big southern city of Sada Bandera. So we, we had already joined the Zulu force, part of the two Sai force had now joined up with Zulu. It was the armored cars, it was the mortars. Myself as a signaler uh, with these uh, 50 ELP uh, freedom fighters, uh, we attacked Sada Madeira. I covered that, I believe, in the first session. And then the second session dealt with uh, the week we spent in Sada Bandera, uh, consolidating our forces. A uh, separate Zulu force went down to the west, to the coastal town of Mo, uh, Mosamides, uh, captured that as well, came back to Sada Madeira, and all of a sudden I found myself being called to the airports and becoming now the signaler driver of the second in command, uh, uh, Commandant Kotza of the Zulu force. From there, we went up and we captured town after town. Uh, we had uh, one or two big battles, of course, um, the Battle of Katang, which I covered, which was uh, the first uh, encounter with uh, Cuban forces, which uh, came to us as a bit of a surprise. Uh, we then went on to capture Lubitu, uh, but first uh, uh, the, the large city of uh, Benguela, which was also a massive uh, fight. It lasted just a few hours. Uh, we eventually took it over. Uh, the, I was part of the Zulu HQ. We um, basically camped out in the, the airport building of uh, both Benguela and then the next day, uh, we also went to Lubitu. Uh, we had a couple of interesting stories to tell. If you go back to my second chapter of uh, a plane arriving in the middle of, out of nowhere, and these reporters stepping out of the plane and how are we going to hide ourselves as uh, South Africans, 1000 kilometers inside Angola. Uh, we succeeded to do that somehow. Uh, they left. Uh, without knowing that we had actually been there. Interesting story, I believe. We ended up having them meet only with some of the black FNLA and UNITA commanders that were working with us. Thereafter, we started making our way north on, on the way to, Lula, to Luhando, of course. Uh, that was the ultimate goal, I guess, of the SADF. We had already... Uh, I think achieved beyond expectations the initial encounters or uh, goals that they had set for themselves in Angola. It was now roughly already the 11th of November. If I could just check my notes. 
Uh, we took Lubito Airport on the 8th of November. So that was three days before independence. The Angolans were going to re receive from the Portuguese independence on the 11th of November, whoever was in control of the country at that particular point in time. And we were, if, if it was 200 kilometers from Luanda, maybe the South African government still thought there was a, a faint possibility that we'd actually turn things around. So they let us continue the battle. It wasn't necessarily unknown to us, but it wasn't necessarily uh, taken for granted. And we were told, the Zulu force was told to continue making their way up the coast. In the internal side of or central uh, core of, of the country, there was another force led by Commandant Webb called Foxbat, and they were also making their way up the center of the country, but we were far closer to Luanda, I guess. So we made our way up to Nova Redondo, and this is where I left off last time. Halfway to Nova Redondo, I also covered the story where the FNLA troops uh, committed mutiny and refused to carry on fighting. They weren't used to all these rocket attacks and, and moving day after day. That's not what they expected. Uh, we brought in a commander of the FNLA to come speak to them, and that turned uh, things around and they agreed to continue the fight. So after uh, being halfway between Lubito and Novo Redondo, the armed, uh, the armed commanders, uh, the armed forces of the airlines started making their way north to Novo Redondo. They were always leading. And there was quite a bit of uh, fighting all the way up to the capture of the town, a seaside resort, a beautiful seaside resort. And on the 11th of November, uh, we were halfway there. The next day, we were finally on the 13th. It took two days while they cleaned up the operations there. And on the 13th of November, which was just basically a day after independence or two days after independence, where the MPLA were already having their, uh, their celebrations in Luanda, that now they were controlling the country, uh, we arrived in Nova Redondo. Now, at the same time, unknown to us, and this is just part of my readings many, many years later, and I want to share with you documents, the CIA and the American government, and uh, there was a secret committee called the 40s Committee, that I don't want to get in now, but this was the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Defense, and a couple of the top, top advisors of the American president. They were very, very worried about uh, the Cuban influence. Thousands of Cubans were, had been flown in. I even have a document uh, that has been uncensored after 30, 40 years, showing that they discussed actually sending a U-2 spy plane above Angola because they had no idea. If we didn't have any intelligence and they didn't have spy satellites at the time, and there were certainly not Americans with us, how were they going to gather the information? Uh, and there was a lot at stake. They didn't want to put in money and, and they didn't want to put in American troops. They were off to Vietnam and unknown to us. So we were just a few hundred South African troops on the ground in Angola, but this was being discussed at the highest levels of the American government all the way up to the president, almost daily. What's going on in Angola? How can we influence things to improve uh, the situation and to avoid the MPLA actually taking over? But we'll, re we'll do that in another stage, in another discussion. Uh, I want to try and close and finish the story of what actually took place. Zulu moved into this beautiful little village of Novo Redondo on the seaside, uh, different units took up uh, their own headquarters in a hotel or a seaside resort. Uh, the Zulu HQ, we found right at the very northern tip of this town, we found uh, beautiful offices of some import export company. And we made our, we camped out over there. And we were actually there for about five, six days. During those days, Commandant Breitenbach and some of the you know, Ricky and other troops of the SADF uh, tried to find ways to cross 
the bridge just to the north of, or north of the town that the Cubans had actually blown up. They looked for other alternative bridges. Uh, the rainy season had uh, come in and all the side roads were totally muddy. The, the islands were being bogged down and they couldn't continue. But within a day or two of attempts and every time they showed their faces, those red eyes were shooting straight at them. The Cubans were waiting on the other side of the river and any sign of South African troops they were shot at. So word got back obviously to the South African uh, uh, headquarters in Rundu that there's just no ways we can continue from there. At the same time, uh, in the center of the country, the Cubans had blown bridges over what we know as the Naya River, where Bridge 14 eventually took place. And basically this was the start of the stalemate throughout Angola. Uh, on the west, in the center, South African troops couldn't move forward. Um, on the other hand, the Cubans couldn't attack us either because they were on the other side and the bridges were blown. So we spent a week, uh, a very good week. The South African troops in Nova Redonda during that week had a wonderful time. They went swimming in the nude. Uh, they were eating and we were eating crayfish uh, at, a, at the boardroom, the HQ at least, at the boardroom in this office. We had a poor, an elderly Portuguese guy with us and they brought these fresh crayfish. I'd never eaten crayfish in my life. It's not kosher, by the way, but what the hell. At the time, you ate whatever you could. And yeah, we were eating the top of the top. And so I learned with him how to, to make crayfish and you throw them in the boiling water with lots of wine. And there were, even the wine, everybody knows, those who were there at the time, we, the troops either hijacked or they came across a massive truckload full of thousands of bottles of wine. And the next morning, you can imagine every single South African troop had one hell of a hangover. So, so many people have got very, very fond memories of, of, of their stay in over Redondo. But like all things, it comes to an end. And on the 20th of November, 2000, uh, 1975, uh, a decision came uh, from, from above, splitting up uh, the Zulu force. Half of the Zulu force was going to remain uh, on site to make sure that there's no you know, counterattack by the Cubans. And the other half was going to make their way back and inland to strengthen the force in, in the center of the country. And, and that's, that's where I myself um, said goodbye to uh, Commandant Kotza, who had up to now, then been the second in command. He was to remain as the commander of the, the Western flank he stayed there with all the Bushman troops. And I then teamed up with Major Bestbeer, who was in charge of uh, a whole troop of uh, FNLA soldiers. He had trained them. He was one of the first initial officers who had trained the troops in Angola prior to Operation Savannah. And he was like the second in command of uh, Commandant Breitenbach. So it was Commandant Breitenbach, uh, Major Bestbeer, who I now joined as his driver and signaler, as well as the FNLA troops and uh, one or two troops of armored cars, we made us our way back down south to Lubitu. From there, we turned inland. It took us a day and a half. Uh, we stayed over, and this was driving in the pelting rain. We were totally so so sopping wet. Uh, we had no shelter. We had an open Jeep with uh, no windscreen wipers. and the rain was unbelievable. We slept over at some place called Nova, uh, Norton de Matos, which is south of Sela. And then the next morning, we made ourselves uh, our way up to Sela. And that was on the 22nd of November. We spent three days in Sela. And it was at this very time, while we were just camped out at Sela and just arrived at Sela, that the Battle of Ebu took place. This was, um, I wasn't there myself and neither were the Zulu force. And I don't know why a decision was made at that time uh, not to first strengthen the force up north of Sela, about 40, 40 kilometers north of Sela with these troops that have just arrived, the Zulu troops, armored cars and everything. Uh, but a decision was made to go ahead and try and find an alternative way to cross the, the Nia River. Sela was, uh, 40 kilometers south of this bridge. 
and they looked for alternative ways. And there was a small town called Ebo that they had already reconnoitred. They had seen that it was empty, but the Cubans were sitting and waiting. They had set up camp. They knew that it was like one of the only alternatives for, for us to attack. I wasn't there, so I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but it was a, the South African troops there uh, walked into a major trap. About 50 uh, troops were killed. I, I have other, there are other reports of up to 100. Uh, South African SADF troops, I think there were four. I have the names in one document, but I can check with the guys. And of course, maybe it would be an opportunity, a good opportunity to gather together some of the guys who are on the Savannah group and let's have an open discussion. Let them discuss openly online uh, what actually took place in their part. There was a lot of bravery there. Some people got medals after that, some didn't. And actually one of the guys who was there was my own Sergeant Major at the time, Sergeant Major Berger from Tusai. And uh, he himself uh, got a, a bravery medal after that for his role. And he actually came out of that whole attack. He, uh, he came out alive, but he, he, he got very, very um, messed up, I think psychologically as a result, because he was sure he was gonna be dead. Um, the armored troops themselves showed a lot of bravery, jumping out of the armored cars and going to fetch their buddies who, where the armored cars had got shot out. Uh, but it was a total disaster. Uh, no Cubans were actually killed. I, I've got a, a document actually of a friend of mine who was a medic uh, back then, uh, written on the 28th, on the 28th of November, saying that uh, troops were be, being brought. He was, I think, in Serpo Pinto and that injured troops were being brought in by the lorry load uh, for medical treatment. And actually he even wrote as follows, and I'm going to just quote over here. The guy's name I met up, I've known him almost all my life, but I didn't know he was in Operation Savannah at, as a medic. His name is Charles Rubin. On Sunday, the 28th of November, he wrote as follows, okay. The doc came and told us what was happening. And I think that we are wasting our time here. Uh, 30 people are dead and 100 injured. And I also understand that Laurie is also dead. This, this, and then he wrote this, it's, it's right here, I'll share it with you. And, and a few days later in his diary, same diary, he says, and I understand that Laurie Shockett has gone missing in Angola, oh shit. So I didn't know about this at all. I discovered it like 30, 40 years later. Um, but I also discovered another interesting story. There was, uh, there was a guy about eight, nine years ago who, who contacted my daughter on Facebook. And he wrote as follows. I haven't got it here in front of me, but I'm going to share the document. He writes to my daughter and he says, his name is Frick Nachel. And he says, Dear Lital, I was up in Angola with your father, something to that extent. And for 37 years, I, I believe that he was dead. <laughs> and I'm so happy to find out that he's alive today because you know there was just no communication. He obviously didn't see me and he got back to Wolfus and whatever, and there was a miscommunication. And, and that is a story um, that you know I take with me. Uh, as you heard, I had gone into Angola with the two side troops already in um, at the very, very first stage. I left them, just myself and my soldier major to join these 50 freedom fighters. I got to Sada Bandera and then I joined uh, the commandant, the second in command of Zulu. Uh, a few weeks later, I then went and joined somebody else. So it, I was just moving from one to another and somehow obviously everybody just lost track of me. Anyhow, so let's get back to reality. We arrive in Sela. Uh, get our stuff together, hear about this terrible attack that's now taken place. And immediately we get moved out to uh, a place called Santa Comba, which is about 30 kilometers north of Sela. And just north of there, we set up a camp in what is called the Pig's Kraal, a very famous little area just below 
the mountain range that separated a low mountain range that basically separated the near river where bridge 14 was and the rest of the South African troops. And we were sent there to now strengthen the whole front line because honestly, looking back, keep in mind, there were no South African uh, defense force uh, infantry troops there. You know, there were, there were armored guys, there, were, there, were artil there was artillery, there was transport, there were medics, there was us. But the actual troops on the ground were these, uh, the black fly uh, soldiers of UNITA and FLA that were terribly trained or trained for a very, very short time and they had no idea at the time. And, and these were the guys who were now on the front line, had the Cubans after Ebo, taken the initiative and attacked us, it could have been a total disaster because we were wide open uh, for that type of attack. And either way, two, three days later, we set up camp. Uh, we spread ourselves along that whole ridge of mountains and at least uh, any Cuban spotted planes and there were uh, Cuban spotted planes flying over uh, would have seen us and, and held back. So there was no counter attack by the Cubans not at that stage, and not in Novo Redondo. The Cubans, a few months later, um, they never actually uh, ever really attacked us. I want to discuss another, there were two key aspects of, of my stay there, because now life got very boring. We were sitting in this, I'll share one or two pictures. We were sitting in this little farmhouse. Once again, I was on the radio all the time, 24 hours a day. We made our way back to Sela where there was a hospital and there was an airport. That was the HQ, the new HQ that had been set up for the front command. Uh, Zulu, as Zulu did no longer exist, we were, now, uh, we were now called Bravo. Alpha stayed back in Novo Redondo and we were now the, the Bravo battle force as part, of, um, as part of the local battle force that was there already. There was Orange and, 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 and they set up X-Ray. Um, as well as one or two other battle forces at the time. So we were just part of a bigger battle force uh, on the border now protecting our, our flags. One day I made my way back. It was at that very time I made my way back to the airport. And I met up with all these, uh, all these uh, Portuguese mercenaries that had been with me like a month beforehand. So there was great joviality and hugging and kissing and all that type of thing. I'll show you one or two pictures. These were my buddies and they used to call me Bambino because I was just such a young looking 18 year old at the time. Now I'm a young looking 60 year old or whatever, but still. And um, so it was very jovial. Uh, unfortunately, a few days later, I under, uh, understood that quite a few of these guys were actually killed. Uh, unfortunately, uh, some grenades blew up and um, that was a pity. But while I was there, I had my camera with me. I want to just take you back quickly because I skipped that. One of the key uh, things that happened that was a turning point in Novo Redondo with the five days we were there was that I went with uh, Commandant Kotze to this big house. They called it the pink house. And that's where uh, a woman who was living there, a very large black woman, but very nicely, a posh woman, dressed very elegantly. She apparently was like the mayor of this little town. And we sat there in our camouflage uniforms inside the lounge, having a cup of coffee, surrounded by literally almost hundreds of black faces. She had her family there and servants, and there were lots of little kids all staring at us with our guns and what have you. And one couldn't actually differentiate. Half of them were the servants and the other half were the family. I'm sitting there while these discussions and negotiations are taking place, you know, how to actually run the town. And I see a Kodak Instamatic camera on the side on the table. Now, if for those who, who, who watched the first session, you will recall that back in Sada Bandera, I went into a shop and I bought two spools, but I had no camera. So this was my opportunity. So the woman sees me looking at the camera and she says, take it. I said, no, I can't take it, you know, <laughs> buy it. I don't have money or whatever, but I was very embarrassed and she insisted that I take. And that was a turning point for me because I had that camera and now I had the spools. 
So some of the pictures that you're going to see now just before and maybe soon afterwards are pictures that I took in and around Santa Comba and, and Sela. And each picture tells a story. And I'm going to tell you about just one of those pictures now. And you're going to see it. There's a picture on the tarmac at the Sela airport. You'll see a C-130 transport plane. They were coming and going. If you recall, they're bringing in South African troops now without the camouflage uniform because the story had almost been blown already. Some re American reporter, I think it was the New York Post, had already posted an interview that he did with some supposed Portuguese uh, troop that had a, 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 a real South African accent. And the story had apparently already been blown. It was going to be blown again in another two weeks when uh, three South African troops were captured by the Cubans when they just drove up north and, and they didn't see the checkpoint and they drove straight into the Cubans uh, and were taken prisoner. Our story was almost over. South African troops were now being flown in daily by uh, C-130 planes in, in, in their brown uniform. So when we arrived at Sela, we were shocked because we were walking around in camouflage uniform and you're seeing all these guys in, and they're looking at us very strangely because we were already standing out standing out in a crowd. So I had my camera and I took a picture of the C-130 and just in front of it was a small Cessna painted with camouflage. I knew nothing about that Cessna, but in 2007, a guy by the name of Stephen Dunkley contacts me on email. Somehow he got word of the fact that I had a picture of this plane and he starts investigating this plane. What happened? is that either on the same day that I took that picture or the day afterwards, that plane, which was a Cessna 185 with a, two Air Force officers and a, and a Captain Talyard of 7 Sai, got in that plane. It was a spotted plane and they flew over Ebo. It was actually the day after Ebo that they flew over to see, to try and see uh, the Cuban troops and they got shot down. The Cubans shot them down and obviously they were killed, but they went missing in action. These guys were missing in action until April 2006. So think about it. This is 31 years. I don't know how many South Africans know this story, but for 31 years after this operation, there were three South African troops whose bodies had never been uh, recovered. And, uh, Stephen Dunkley was one of the guys who was now trying to get all the facts and figures together. He saw this plane. This was the, I think, the only picture of this plane. And it was taken literally either hours or a day before it was shot down. So in a way, the good news out of this whole story is that finally uh, the bodies were found. The plane wreckage was found 31 years later and the bodies were returned to South Africa for burial. So that's just one picture. As I said, one picture tells the story. You will see pictures of the 25 pounders going up north. You will see pictures of the kraal uh, where we were sitting in front line. You actually can see the yields at the back. Those yields were separating us by not more than, I think, two kilometers from the front line. And the battle was continuing. They were shooting the missiles over the yield to the South African lines. Remember, we were just behind the yield, so they didn't even see us. We were too close. They were shooting 20 kilometers, 30 kilometers behind us. And we had our five fives. We had brought up five fives. We had four five five guns. And their, their rockets were out shooting the five fives by just a few kilometers. So, what our troops did, and I discovered the actual tactics there of just a few years ago, is um, we would shoot some salvos from the five fives, just from two of them. And while we were shooting from the two, they'd move the other two up like a kilometer or two. Then they shoot from the other two and then they'd move the other two. So the Cubans never really knew how much, how, how much weaponry we had, how many guns we had. They, didn't, they couldn't home in on them either and destroy them. So these four, they were just four guns, four big guns, were never actually shot out by the Cubans during this time. But this stalemate couldn't go on forever. And after, after about a week of uh, being 30 kilometers north of Santa Comba,
we were pulled back uh, to 20 kilometers north of Santa Comba. So we went from one place to another. And on the 4th of December, the 4th, 4th 5th of December, roughly, dates could change a little bit. We actually went back to Sela for a few days. When we were in Sela, five days before Bridge 14, and Bridge 14 was now South Africans, they were starting to try and rebuild it, etc. cetera. Um, we needed intelligence. And I was with uh, Commandant Breitenbach and also with uh, uh, Major Frank Bespeer. And we played a little role in Bridge 14. We weren't in Angola anymore when Bridge 14 actually took place. We had left. But I'm going to maybe just read a, just a little excerpt from my book that one day will be published, uh, just to put a bit of perspective as to what took place. Although on the day of Bridge 14 attack, I were, I'd already arrived back in Southwest Africa, I want to share my short uh, role in the preparation for this attack and the events that took place uh, 42 years ago. And this is in memory of, of my good buddy from Worcester High School, Tom Lotz, who I'm going to discuss in, in, in separate detail in, in one of the next sessions, because that's an amazing story in itself. I wasn't with him. He was one of a few infantry troops that crossed the river to check out the Cubans. They were shot and he was killed. He was killed on the 10th of December. Uh, 1975. Unknown to me, I only discovered that afterwards. So I had arrived in Sela with Major Frank Bespeer and Commandant Breitenbach and their Bravo and Charlie battalions of FNLA from Novo Redondo almost two weeks beforehand. In fact, we had arrived on the day of the Ebo battle. So we had a number of recce's with us and one of them was brought to us, his name by the name of Didis. Didis was better known, uh, he wrote his own book, he unfortunately passed away, I believe, from cancer a number of years ago. And, and are we talking about a, a young guy. He must have been maybe a year or two older than me at the time. His uh, formal name was Andre Diedrichs. He was just a, a corporal, a lovely looking young guy. And I had to train him in uh, using the radio. He is, he is a recce. What he didn't know about uh, radio signals and that. And I had to do this in advance of his trek on foot north to the yields up and what, what we, was known as Top Hat. Each yield surrounding Bridge 14 had a name. And he was going to go up onto the Top Hat, overlooking the near river. Now, this had been blown up and the bridge was sunk uh, underneath the water because South Africa wanted to now build this new bridge in the, in the coming days. He was to set up an observation post hidden in the shrubbery and report back on everything he saw. Brayton Bach and Best Beer went over the maps with him, his rations, all the operational aspects of this extremely dangerous mission. Without it, we and all the South African troops were blind as to what was going on on the other side of the hill. As our planes couldn't fly over anymore, as the Cessna had just been shot down the day before or the week before. So off he went with just one black FNLA troop to support him because the others all just ran away, unfortunately. So just did he send one guy uh, who was helping him carry the radios and the batteries and some food. And uh, in the meantime, in this little house, myself, Best Beer and, and Breitenbach, uh, we set up three radio sets, okay? One was to uh, contact Didis up on the front. The other one was connected to the 5-5 five five artillery because Didis has, had no idea actually how to give commands to an artillery unit where and how to shoot and distances, etc. Neither did I, but now you're going to hear how we did it. Okay. And also, uh, we had a third set where we were reporting to the Seller HQ. So there we were sitting with three radios, one on top of the other. And for the next 24, 48 hours, this is what took place. By the next morning, Didis had found the perfect hidden spot from where he started reporting the activities of the FAPLA and the Cuban troops in the vicinity of the bridge. What emerged was a chilling scenario of more and more vehicles and Cuban troops arriving all the time. The preparation of mortars, rocket launchers, the red eyes as we know them, and a hive of activity. For hours, I had Breitenbach and Best Beer breathing down my neck with each and every update. Keep in mind that it wasn't that we could simply leave the radios on all the time. 
uh, as we do nowadays with our cell phones and listen in and, and whatever. We were constantly around the clock with them in our ears. Okay, we couldn't also take the chance of the Cubans homing in on him. Okay, so the updates when he gave them were a matter of a few seconds. Uh, no time for Morse codes and writing down notes. He just had to speak openly. And I want to tell you one other thing when it comes to radio. South Africa went into Angola um, totally on the quiet. Nobody was supposed to know we South Africans. So to avoid any foreign forces or whatever listening in and capturing us speaking on the radio, we only spoke in English. Back on the border where there was one week in English, one week in Afrikaans. Up in Operation Savannah, we only spoke in English. Okay. But things changed because all of a sudden they realized that the Russian ships out of, of the sea that were patrolling up and down Angola were listening into us. The Cubans were listening into us. They all understood English. And I don't know exactly when it was, but roughly when we were at Sela, the, they said, Prat Afrikaans, in the hope that nobody's going to understand us. So from then on, in this whole operation, everything was actually done in Afrikaans. But I'm, a, I'm from Worcester, so it wasn't a problem. Okay. Eventually, a decision was made to start firing uh, the 5.5 five cannons in the direction of the crawl, uh, which was right nearby the bridge and where the main activity was actually taking place. So the following hours actually went like this. Didis tried to estimate as closely as possible the bearings of the crawl. We would look at our maps and then we would pass this on to the artillery. They would fire a single shot, one gun at a time. Once the shot was fired with a break in the middle, Didis would report back roughly where it landed. Let's say a half a kilometer to the west or to the north or whatever. And then we would report that back to the five fives. Of course, we were reporting to Rundu, not to Rundu, to, to the HQ as well. And, uh, and this is what was going on. It was a ping pong. Uh, we had no radar. And this was the only way we had of slowly but surely homing in on what was going on at the crawl. This way, each individual gun would be notified accordingly and make its own adjustments. The first few rounds flew far and wide but it didn't take long before we closed in the crawl. My adrenaline was flowing like anything. I hadn't shot at anyone the whole time I'd been in Angola for now for almost two months. And now I was finally playing a role, an active role in wiping out actually tens of the enemy. And so it was that all the guns managed to home in on the crawl. And after that, on the soldiers that jumped into the river and Didis was reporting back nonstop on vehicles being blown up and the destruction of the Stalin organs, uh, soldiers being wiped out and a total overall scene of, of total carnage. The room was electric with excitement and we were having to pass this on in parallel to the HQ. But by the time it died down, there were no more movement in and around the crawl. Those who could flee had fled. Uh, it was a stunning success. But now Didis was in serious trouble. We notified him to move to another position as soon as doctors set in and to now maintain radio silence until noon the next day. Sure enough, at first light, a helicopter gunship flew backwards and forwards right above his head because they knew we had somebody up there and they were trying to search for him and to get and just get rid of him. And they and, and that took about three days. And only about three days later, he arrived back on foot. Uh, with a stunning success. And this was a critical success because now we had got rid of all those troops in and around Bridge 14 and the sappers could then come in during those days and they built that bridge out of wood and the first armored cars managed to cross the bridge and, and the rest is history. They made a movie of it in the end. Whether the movie was accurate or not, never ever saw it. Uh, he later received the honoris crooks for his bravery and continued for many years to lead other secret operations and earn more and more medals as time went by. He unfortunately, passed away from cancer a few years ago. So that was the story of, of, of Didis and, and our uh, preemptive little operation prior to, to Breach 14. We eventually, uh, we had been there now for just over two months. We were the last remaining uh, troops that had gone, back, uh, gone in to Angola over two months ago. Uh, from Ruokana and from Pere Pereira de Esch, and it was time for us to be replaced. We were really tired. 
Uh, we had had no communication uh, with back home for months now, and we were relieved. So that decision was made. And together it was uh, Commandant Breitenbach uh, and, uh, and uh, the rest of the, what was left of the Zulu HQ. It was Captain Saurav Kruger, who was the uh, signal, signals officer, who was with us the whole way. Uh, Commandant Breitenbach, Breitenbach, Major Bestbeer, and a couple of the recce guys who had been you know, training and, and looking after the FNLA troops. They were driving the trucks. One of the trucks was full of, of booty, of all sorts of weapons that they, these guys had collected throughout. And we drove down in a straight line down to Rundu. It took us three days. We camped out for two nights on the way. Uh, we had, for the first time, no armored cars with us. We had no protection, really. Uh, you'll see a picture of me. I was, I would, you know, uh, we were in our, our, our land cruiser. We were right in front, either me with a gun or me driving. And we were driving straight through Swapo territory as well. So in a way, you know, we, we were on our way home, but you weren't sure that you were going to get there until you got there. Okay, because at any stage, uh, Swapo troops could come out of the sites. Along the way, we dropped off the black troops at their own towns and villages, because that's where they came from originally. Uh, the one night when we, I'll never forget this, the night one, one night when we, <clears throat> we, we were staying over at camp and uh, the Captain Kruger was trying to contact Rundu. Now, now we're in the middle of Angola, in the middle of the bush somewhere, uh, in his armored vehicle, and, and in, in his Jeep, and he couldn't contact Rundu. So I'm a 19 year old, what do I know? I take these, these cords and I climb up two of these big trees and I make a massive T connection to the radio. And before you know it, you know, I'm just a troop, he's a captain. And before you know it, we've got uh, Rundu loud and clear. We know to find them that we're on our way. So this is when I first started in the first session, we arrived back at, uh, we stopped in at Serpo Pinto and we arrived in Rundu on the 10th of December, 1975. That was the day of Beach 14. And unfortunately that was also the day that Tom Lotz, my buddy actually got killed. We crossed the border, we drove into the Rundu camp. No, uh, not one MP searched us or stopped us. We saw them there at the entrance. We're already aware of the fact that these guys like to just strip search everybody. But when they looked at us, or not, maybe not me, but they looked at these Ricky guys who were like really serious and armed to the teeth and said, like, you don't, 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 don't mess with me. And we actually just rode into the Rundu camp. I don't think any a little convoy, there were only a couple of vehicles left by then, uh, had actually just driven in like that without being stopped. I went for a meal, I went for a shower. There was a movie playing. I, I, I was just finished. That was the end. The, the Rekis just spent a few hours there and off they went to the east, to the Caprivi. They had their own secret base there. And I was left on my, on my own. I had this big bag of all my goodies that I had stored uh, and, and, and also collected along the way. And I was dead scared that the, the MPs would, you know, come and take everything away. And I had the two spools. So... What I did is I found a driver actually, who was driving down to Grootfontein the next day, and I was gonna jump on a plane down to Grootfontein. So just to make sure that I don't get searched when I get on the plane, I gave him the spools. He went on his convoy the next morning. I flew out to Grootfontein the next day, and I met up with him and I got my two spools back. But what I did do was I left my bag of goodies and, and I never got searched. I walked, I walked out off the plane into Grootfontein. I was the only guy amongst, I don't know, hundreds of troops and activity. You know, the, the war in Angola was like really, really, at, I don't want to say at its height. It was at its stalemate position. But thousands of troops were flown, being flown in. Cuba already had like over 20,000 troops there. They were bringing in MiGs and, and you name it. And the situation was really getting dangerous for South Africa at the time. America at that time had already decided to pull out because the Organization of African Unity, which kind of supported, not South Africa, supported the Western, you know, uh, 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 the Western uh, forces, the UNITA, the FNLA, they kind of realized now that South Africa was behind this. Um, so they had to pull out. 
And once they were not behind the FNLA and UNITA anymore, or South Africa, the American government had to actually turn around and also say, all right, that's, uh, that's us. We, we can't be seen to be supporting the pariah state of South Africa. And that was like the beginning of the end of, of Savannah. They were still flying troops in, but it all, the decision had already been made and promises given to the United States government that we were pulling out. But you can't just pull out thousands of troops. We had troops stationed in every single town and village all over Angola. So it had to be an organized effort that took two months till I think mid-February. Uh, and, and that was just to follow, just keep in mind that even after we clawed out, we had no idea what was going on back in South Africa. You had no idea that we were, we were even in Angola and that there were thousands of troops in Angola. So I flew down to Grootfontein. I left my bag behind. Uh, what's lost is lost. And now there I am in my camouflage uniform, walking around with an AK-47 and my hair is long and I'm unshaved, not that I, I grow a big beard. Everybody's looking at me strangely. I go into the mess to eat. They gave me a bed in one of the, the bunks, uh, in, in one of the buildings. And all I needed were three things. I needed a new set of uniform. I needed a new gun. And I needed a, a train ticket back to Walfers Bay. It took me three days of walking around and people looking at me. Nobody asked me a question. Everybody is kind of dead scared. Who is this guy walking around there? I, after day number two, I got my train ticket, but I didn't get my uniform. I went into the sergeant major. I was like full of myself by then. I, I very, you know, you've been through a lot. You don't give a damn for rank anymore. I'd been sitting around and spending time with commandants and colonels. I walked into the sergeant major of the RSM of, of the Court Fontaine. And I said, I've got, here's my ticket and my trains tomorrow morning. I'm going on the train. It's a civilian train. I'm going on my train, on the train, just like this. In this, you're with my, and let the people ask me questions because that's it. I'm not staying here one more day. Well, lo and behold, all of a sudden, a brand new uh, R1 rifle is given to me and a clean set of you. That was a big mistake. I would have loved to actually keep all that stuff. And so I had my new set of browns and, and a new rifle with no number on it. I got on the train. I took the few hour train journey. I arrived back at, to a totally empty base at Tusai. I walked in there. There was hardly anybody there, hardly anybody I knew. And just a few days later, this, uh, the, uh, the two side troops started coming back by, by train, train after train after train as they started pulling them out of Angola before Christmas. And only then, because only then, when my original buddies from Bravo Company, who were the guys who came from the Cape, they walked in and they looked at me and they said, but you're supposed to be dead. These guys had been around for like a month or maybe two months in Angola on the understanding they had never heard where I was, what happened to me other than this rumor that was spread by Sergeant Major Berger, who had got shot up in Ebo, that Laurie was a goner. And so that was a, a lot of happy reunions with my buddies there. And we eventually clawed out. I had one last issue when I clawed out. I tried to return my rifle. And the guys looked and they said, that's not your rifle. So I said, so what? Just Are you taking it or not? They don't want to take the rifle because they want to know where's my regional rifle. I said, it got shot up somewhere in Angola. Take it or leave it. It's brand new. What the hell? Anyhow, so that, that worked out. And then a three-day train trip back to Cape Town. And, and questions were asked. But I, I was like, I think everybody who came out of, of Angola at the time were tight-lipped. They'd been through a lot uh, and they definitely weren't ready to start telling their story. My buddies tried to, uh, they took me to some house in Cape Town where there's a pool. And that's the, close the closest course that I came to dying because they got me nice and drunk and they threw me into the pool when I was drunk and I almost drowned. Two months or three months up in Angola, nothing happened to me. But I almost drowned in Cape Town the day after I got back. Either way. So uh, that's my story. I, I, in the next session, I want to cover one or two specific uh, subjects. 
Uh, I mentioned uh, Tom Lotz and all the whole story surrounding his death. And 40 years later, when we connected uh, the real story with his family, uh, one or two other stories, a lot of documents as well that I'd like to share. If it's from the CIA, if it's from internal uh, documents within the SADF. And here I have to thank, um, well, there are a few people I have to thank, but I'll do it at a later stage. But when I went to South Africa from Israel in 2014 for the 40th uh, uh, um, high school reunion, I flew up to Pretoria and I met up with a, um, with a reporter and she's a journalist. And she's written one or two books on the troops on the border. Her name is Jackie Thompson. And with her, we went to the South African military archive, which was, wow, it, it was not protected at all. We walked, we could have literally walked out with original letters from Zavimbi and original documents. But it was at that time, roughly in 2014 or a bit before that, that a lot of the documentation of Operation Savannah, in and around Operation Savannah had been, uh, de what's the word, uh, declassified, okay? And it was all available to read. And I came there with a camera and with, uh, and we just took photos, hundreds of photos. And of these, I, I want to share a couple of those very interesting documents with you guys. And anybody watching who happens to be in and around Pretoria, I, I, I should imagine that many years later, one could go visit these archives and one could page through the documents. I specifically was only looking for Zulu, but there are, there are plenty files of all the other operations and the other uh, battle groups as well. Okay, so I think we'll leave it at that. My hour is almost up. Uh, I think I've covered most of what I wanted to for this session and we'll see you next time. Well, Ari, you better write that book, my man, because really, I'm looking forward so much to writing for to reading that. But did you know? Did you know at that stage that you are actually part of history? That something big is happening around you at the age of eighteen. We had no idea, you know. Of course, even after that, for ten years, twenty years, thirty years, before the Facebook group started coming up. And there was no way, there was no communication. I was on my own out there, as were most of the people in Angola, other than maybe the guys in the armored cars who were like a group, a, a consolidated group together. Um, so they fought together, they came out together. Maybe they were in contact for many years thereafter. Uh, maybe also uh, not only the armored, but the artillery guys as well. Uh, but a lot of the the guys in the different Facebook groups today are people that actually came into Angola without knowing where the hell they're going to. They were flown in or they were driven in. They weren't told where they're going to, why they're going there. They had signed documents, secret, secrecy documents, and they'd arrive on the front in and around cellar and they'd be shot out. And a lot of these guys really, really suffered uh, with uh, PTSD afterwards. Um, and, and they never maybe ever heard of how the hell did we get there in the first place? So when they left Angola, they came in for a month, two months. They had no idea how we got there um, and why we were there in the first place. But they, didn't, they were never told the history of how Portugal had pulled out and how and why South Africa had gone in, in in the first place and how we got into Angola over a thousand kilometers inside Angola um, you know, from, from the border. But we had no idea of our role in history and my reading, I can tell you of what was going on at the highest levels, as I mentioned, in the South African government and in where also the most of the government didn't know about it. It was only a handful of people. And also within the American, it was the Cold War, it was the height of the Cold War, straight, uh, not even a year after Vietnam. And you've got 30,000 Cubans in Africa uh, for us South Africans, we had an interest. This wasn't an apartheid war, by the way. This was just a, a, a geographical political war where South Africa had an interest not to have a communist country on its border. Cuba, for Cuba, it was, it was like Vietnam. They were flying troops thousands of kilometers away to a war that wasn't their own. And hundreds, maybe even thousands of Cubans were actually sh shot and killed or, you know, during this, these couple of months. 
And they got stuck there for, for years afterwards as well. We were in and out within six months. Yes, that's very true. I spoke to somebody who had told me that some of the Cuban helicopter pilots were there for 15 years without going home. Now, yeah. that is very long. That, that's crazy. But I'm really glad about this, and I'm glad that you're coming back also. And I want to create a playlist on Legacy Conversations for Savona. So I invite everybody who were at Savona in any which way. Please come and talk to us. And we're looking forward to you as well, Laurie. As soon as you're back, we're going to make these things. We will honor your friend. May you rest in peace. And I want to say to all of you here, if you have a story, please come and talk to us. Let this history not die out. Bring it to us. Let us let us talk to each other. Let us get it off our chest. And I thank all of you for listening up to now. Until we meet again, God bless. Thanks, Kurt. Keep well. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.